is our fortress. So if you would, with a grateful heart, let's rise for our strength and our hope. What a friend we have in Jesus.
All right, if you have your Bibles, you can open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll be reading all the way down to the second verse in chapter 3. But this is shaping up uh, to be a series, and the series could be known or called uh, Union with God, right? We are talking about our identity in Christ, who we really are, and then last week we looked at the new you, uh, appropriate for the new year. And we learned two things to really focus on, right? We learned that we really, really died with Christ. And we really, really now live with Christ. So we're going to continue that forward in today's message by going to 2 Corinthians. The title of this morning's message is The True, The True You. I'm actually going to start in verse 1 of chapter 2. Now, remember, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish, but... We speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within it? So also, no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is born uh, from God, that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them. And they're unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 1 says this as Paul continues. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for solid food. Even now, you are still not ready, for you are still in the flesh. We're approaching Easter. Uh, it'll be coming up in a few weeks or a couple months or three months. And as you know, you're going to have a lot of movies that are going to be on cable television. Or if you've been smart and you cut the cord and you don't have cable anymore, you've got a smart television, you're going to be coming across these movies that are going to be replete during this season, right? Uh, there will be a lot of them, a lot of good ones, but primarily the one I want to point to this morning is the Ten Commandments, right? You guys remember, is that a family tradition of yours? It is in the Roop household, or at least it has been ever since I was young, right? We would always watch the Ten Commandments. Charlton Heston, right, plays Moses, and it's a great, fabulous movie, but I've got some trivia for you this morning. You guys remember the scene when Moses goes up 
to the burning bush, right? And we've got the story in Scripture. But he goes up and God begins to speak to Moses, right? He begins to reveal who he is and why uh, he is calling Moses to free his people. Here's the trivia question. Do you know who played God, the sound of God, the voice of God in that movie? Nobody. They kept it under wraps for a long, long time. They never let it get out. But about a decade after the movie was released, it was made aware, made public, that that actually was Charlton Heston that was playing the voice of God in the burning bush. But through technology, they had muffled his voice, right? They had added all of these layers, but it was actually Charlton Heston himself who was playing the voice of God in the burning bush. Now, why do I share that? I share that because that captures and symbolizes the message that Jesus Christ, you could say, has come to share with us, that we come from one source, that we come from one creator. We are all created by God the Father, right? And if we see in Scripture where Adam and Eve in the garden, the one become two, right? You guys remember that. One splits into two. And then in Revelation, right? Two go back to one. The marriage supper of the Lamb. The body of Christ and Christ, right? Coming together as one. And so what we can imagine, so to speak, as we start out here this morning, if God is in the beginning, there's God and only God, God and just God alone, right? As creation comes into existence, every piece of creation is a part of it. It's as if uh, we take cells from our body and if our cells were to have consciousness, this is kind of what uh, creation is about. It's about the discovery of God everywhere. It's about the discovery of God's love, not only within but without, everywhere. Being surrounded by God and we're each an expression of God's love. Now back to our passage. We've often heard this said that I preach Christ and Christ alone. Christ crucified, Christ uh, died, and He was resurrected or raised from the dead. But what Paul is saying here is something a bit different from that. What he's saying to the church in Corinth, he says, I come to you time and time again, but the only thing you can understand is Jesus lived, Jesus was crucified, and Jesus rose again on the third day. That's it. That's your level of comprehension. And what Paul says, is I've got so much more about the hidden wisdom of God, about the mystery of Christ, but you're just not ready for it yet. You should be eating meat, but instead you're drinking milk. Well, I've got confidence in Asbury. We're going to eat the meat this morning. We're going to go down and look at what Paul is talking about here as we continue exploring this understanding of union with God, about our identity, right? About who we really are and why we are here on this earth. And so this series, right, is is about a union with God and and it's for the spiritually mature. And I've been praying for all of you this week that, that, that the Holy Spirit would open up fertile ground with Within us to allow these seeds of truth to transform our lives because honestly, we're not going to make it if we're a humdrum, apathetic, lukewarm Christ follower, right? This world is dark. This world is divisive. There are a lot of tripping hazards on this journey of life. And if we are going to make it, we've got to make it together and we've got to make it understanding who we really are, our true self our higher self, the Holy Spirit within, leading us and guiding us. And the second thing this series is about is about discovering something you never lost. Discovering something you you never lost. And as a reminder, right, Scripture clearly articulates that we were with God from before the foundations of the earth. That's a hard thing to process if you think about it. That somehow we were with God from before the foundations of the earth. We existed before these bodies come into existence, right? And so with that understanding, we are recapturing who we really are in Christ. And so, again, when Paul says that, right, he says that I preach Christ and Him crucified. He is saying that that's a good thing, but there's so many uh, other things or deeper things or hidden wisdom that is available for a child of God. 
God, right? For those who are interested in following Christ, for those who are interested in stepping out of lies and illusions and restrictions, for those who are interested in being right where God wants you to be, understanding that you are exactly as God created you to be, right? This is a message of understanding, right? This is a passage. What Paul is, has written here is a passage of permission to say, hey, for those who are spiritually mature, for those who are serious about spiritual warfare, for those who are serious about saving the lives of your children and your family and your friends, you're going to get ready to explore the hidden mystery of who you are in Christ. You guys ready? Let's dive in. So we looked at last week, remember, that we died with Christ, right? And not only that, that we also live with Christ. And this is about more than just saying, okay, I understand what Jesus has done for me. It's more than being a transaction, right? Our understanding, our experience is more than observing Jesus Christ going to the cross. But there's something other, something more than, something deeper than that actually occurred at that time. We were, as Paul said, with Christ. We died with him. We were on the cross with him. And also, we live as him. We'll read some of these passages in just a moment. We live in Christ now. And so, now let's crank up the volume a little bit on that, if you will. We died with Christ. We live with Christ. And here's deep dive number one. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Let me explain what I mean here. If you look at Jesus' last name, his last name would have been Jesus uh, Bar Joseph, or Jesus the son of Joseph. Christ is, is a, a term, it's a label. The Greek word is Christos, and it means the anointed one. Right? The Messiah, the Hebrew word is Mechek, and it means the anointed one. The Christ Spirit, the second, uh, the Son of God that is in uh, the triune Godhead, right? It's the Christ Spirit that hovered above the waters, right? That brought order into uh, creation, that, that out of chaos brought clarity, right? That out of confusion, uh, He brought a, a structure, right? This is the Christ Spirit. This is uh, God the Father. This is the Holy Spirit that has been in operation ever since the beginning of time. Time. And I know the Trinity is not an easy thing to understand. People have been trying for 2,000 or more years to describe and to communicate it. And I want to give my best effort. And so here it goes. The Trinity is about this. It is about self-emptying love. God, the Father, to the Son, the Son, to the Spirit, and back around receiving the love of God, right? This is the reality. Now, what we typically do when we're talking about Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our beloved, our Redeemer, our Savior, we often make the mistake of skipping past His humanity. We make the mistake of skipping over His humanity, and we only highlight the deity of Jesus. But to really understand the mystery of Christ, we're going to have to go a little bit deeper here this morning, right? This title, Christ the Anointed One, is the Spirit, the Son of God. God perfectly reflected through the life of Jesus Christ, right? Look at 1 Peter 2.21. But there's something else that Jesus invites us into. And it's more inclusive than we've ever thought what He is inviting us into in terms of our life, in terms of our identification, in terms of who He is and who we are. First Peter 2.21 says this, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in His steps. What were His steps? He was always giving His life away, right? He was always seeking the good of of others. When his parents couldn't find him, where was he? He was in the temple teaching, right? Loving the things of God. And we see Jesus approaching the final days of his life here on the earth, right? We see him praying in the Garden of Gethsemane like great drops of blood he was praying. And we gloss over this. We think that is uh, only uh, something that is, Jesus is allowing momentarily for us to say, hey, he identifies with me. No, 
Jesus suffered for me. Imagine if it were you. You know God, you know your role, your identity in God, and you're going against the religious system, right? You know that God does not create garbage. You know that God is seeking restoration and reconciliation with all things, right? And you begin to proclaim this. You begin to start preaching and taking forgiveness of sins out into the streets, right? Who do you think you're going to be in the crosshairs of? It's going to be the system or the institution of religious control that will uh, target you, so to speak, just like they did Jesus. Yet, he moves forward. He carries through, compelled by his great love for humanity. He gives up his life to demonstrate God's love for us, his solidarity with you, his solidarity with the suffering. Christ is showing us something here that we've often relegated to just him and saying that we have no part to play. We're saying it's all him, while Jesus the whole time is saying, follow me. He's not just saying, think great things about me. He says, follow me. We are to pick up our cross, so to speak, and follow in the steps of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Jesus cranks it up again when he says this. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I don't know if you've tried being perfect, but I've given it up a long time ago. I realize I'm nowhere near to that. And what Jesus says right here is something so very challenging, and it is impossible for us to accomplish this in our own effort, with our own strength, with our own fleshly ability. But what Jesus is saying is something so very mysterious and, and profound. This is not a transaction. It's not like, don't ever lie, don't ever cheat, don't ever steal. Of course, that's included. But it's not transactional when Jesus says this. Because for the listeners back in the day, when they heard Jesus say this, they would have the same reaction we would. Be like, I cannot be perfect. I can't even be good half of the time, right? I, there's no way. I've got to give up being perfect. And Jesus knows that. And what he is saying, he is talking about a standing or a relationship that we have with God in Christ. Union with God. Perfection in Christ, in God, right? In Jesus, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, we are understanding the God that we worship here today. And this understanding should uh, compel us to greater love for Jesus, to greater love for not only ourselves, but each other. When we can see His humanity reflected in the Gospels, again, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for those He foreknew, He also preached predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That is why you are uh, experiencing a life right now. You are being conformed into the very image of Christ, right? In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You can say brothers or sisters here. What's happening? Is Jesus is splitting space and time and coming into our reality and coming into our world and showing us something so very profound. He's showing us something so very beautiful about the heart and the nature of God. And it's this, it's that God is always for us, that He is never against us, that He will keep us and protect us and guide us, and that we don't need mediators between us and God, right? We don't need someone else to play the part of stepping in between us and an angry and a vengeful God. This was the life of Jesus, and everywhere He went, he was sharing this message and it got him crucified because people could no longer control life in the spirit. They could control certain elements and rituals and sacraments, but they could not control life in the spirit, which surprised we are all spiritual beings. So we see in the life of Jesus something so very profound that he's pulling us into as our older brother. You know what it means if you have if Jesus is your brother it means that you have all the inheritance that he has 
It means you have the same origin, the same genealogy, you could say, that God is your Father, that if Jesus is our older brother, right, He has went ahead before us, but He also invites us into this space of understanding who we really are, of understanding who He really is. In verse 11 of Romans chapter 8, uh, the Apostle Paul writes this, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. It's not like a co-occupancy thing here. There's not Jason Root cohabitating in here with the Holy Spirit and can substitute your name in this. The very fact that you have life, that you have breath, that your heart is being is proof enough that the divine spark of Christ is within you because where Christ Christ is, life is, right? Where Christ is not, it's death, right? And so this morning, what we see, the very same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the very same Spirit in you right now. The Spirit that looks out from behind your eyeballs and looks upon this great, big, beautiful, chaotic world is the very same Spirit that walked out of that empty tomb, right? It's the very same Spirit that set the prisoners free. It's the very same Spirit that gave sight to the blind. Yet here we are thinking that this walk with Jesus doesn't really involve us. If we can just believe certain facts about Jesus, then we get our golden ticket to heaven. And friends, that's not what this is about. This is about something much more mysterious, powerful, eternal, relevant, and life transforming. So we begin to see, right? We're talking, we're still talking about the true you this morning. We're still talking about something within all of us that we have never lost, but perhaps we're just now discovering right about this jewel, this treasure contained in these earthen vessels, right? We're talking about something so glorious that as a result causes us to live our lives seeking the higher good, right? Not looking at the world or ourselves in terms of objectifying others so that we get what we want or in terms of satisfying ourselves our flesh or our needs at the detriment or destruction of others, but rather when we understand who we really, really are, we will live lives of compassion, of great love, of transformation, and in great power. And so this Christ spirit that dwells, dwelled over the chaotic waters that, that Jesus captured and it filled the life of Christ exponentially is not just a one-time event. Christ is coming to us every moment, every moment of every day. It's a, it's a constant process. Look at our world. Look at the sun. It comes up every day, right? Filling our world with its brilliant light. That's what Christ does in us every minute of the day. It's Christ rising to give us light in our life. It's Christ arising, appearing, and illuminating every part of us. Our second point this morning. Your relationship with God is not an external one. So we've identified and understood the fact that we are united in Christ, right? We've got that Christ is here, Christ is there, Christ is around us everywhere. And the second illumination or the second point is this, is that our relationship with God is not an external relationship. He's not the big man upstairs that looks down occasionally upon our son. He's not distant and apathetic about our plight through life, but instead it's something much more involved, engaged, instrumental, and priceless, right? Question, remember in the Old Testament, right? Where could God's presence be found? To be found in the temple. Where at specifically in the temple? In the Holy of Holies where once a year a priest went in to offer sacrifice for sins, atonement for the people. 
It was relegated there, God's presence in, in the Holy of Holies, right? And, and we see that. We see that in the Old Testament, but then in the life of Jesus, we begin to see something completely different, right? And so as the Apostle Paul says, our bodies are the temple. If in the Old Testament, God dwelled in the Holy of Holies in the temple, but now because of the work of Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we collectively are God's temple, where can His presence be found? In the Holy of Holies with Him. This changes the game. It seems like a little bit of a switch, right? Just talking about psychological framing, but this is way more than that. This gets to the heart. This is right brain stuff that is artistic and full of life, right? This understanding shows a lot of things. Number one, that we are not deficient of the presence of God, that God can be found within us, right? That He abides within, that God's love is permeating through us constantly. Here's another good analogy. When we often try to put behind us all of these bad deeds, we would call, let's just say like addiction. Let's talk maybe about pride or, or our selfishness. What we want to do and what we try to do and what so many people try to do, we keep trying to eliminate those parts of ourselves with our old self. And it'll never work. The old self, the old flesh, the old way of understanding this world and understanding God will leave us bound and powerless, right? In terms of being able to allow the expression and the manifestation of Christ to come through our lives. And so what we do, we pray for God to intervene in our lives. We'll get down and say, I have fallen again and again and again. Jesus, help me to not slip up one more time. And we have this understanding that He's way out in outer space. And if we pray right just long enough and use the right words, that He'll somehow expedite a trip down here and enter into our suffering. And if you think that, there's no judgment for that. There is no blame for that. But what I want to do, like the Apostle Paul was saying in his letter to Corinth, is let's move beyond some basic elementary things here this morning. And let's talk about when you call on the name of Jesus. Christ, what happens? Is He out there beyond the planet Saturn or Neptune or Jupiter just waiting to hear? No, He's a lot closer than that. In fact, He prayed the prayer through you for help and relief. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the true you. And so that's what we are understanding that instead of us calling on Jesus to come down and to rescue us, that the fact that we can even breathe right now is the very heartbeat of God beating through our chest. And so when we try to do better, when we try to drink less, when we try to cuss less, when we try to watch less cable movies, for example, it's not as though we call on God to intervene, but God has already been walking with us. Now we we have to open our eyes to it. We have to understand it. That it's not some humdrum existence in here, but it is the very life of God that created the universe that dwells in you right now. So, we allow the love of Christ to break forward in our lives. We allow the life of Christ to come through our times of suffering and difficulty. We're beginning to see that we are intertwined. Jesus says it. He says, uh, I, I am the branch and you are the vine. Right? That we are grafted in. That we become one with Him. We are intertwined. Right? And, and, and we often think that we are a separate self trying to do good. But in reality, the mystery of God that Paul was talking about, the hidden wisdom of God, is that we are not independent. We are intertwined. As Paul would say, grafted in. And I don't know if there's any horticulturist here or agriculturist. There probably are. I'm probably the least informed on this topic. But if you take two different types of plants, and it's an actual process where you can somehow put one piece of the branch into the, the branch of another, and then over time it grows as one, and you can't tell where the old one stopped and the new one began. That's life in Christ. 
It's the life that is breathing and beating and pulsating through your very being this morning. Now, how does this change? It changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. We understand that union with God is not external. It is internal, right? It is inside here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9 say this. He who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So think of that, if you will. Imagine that your physical body is God's field or his building. Where is he coming through from? Where is he coming uh, into the world through? Or who through? He's coming through you from the inside out. This is why meditation or contemplative prayer or quietude or solitude is so very instrumental and important in the life of a Christian, I believe, because it's then when we connect with the inner voice, right? We allow our false voice or our false self's ideas or words to fall away to the side and what erupts or emerges is the Holy Spirit. You can say also uh, the higher self. You are connecting with God on such a deep and personal level. Look at verse 16 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. This is what we've covered, right? And he's also another added layer to this, not just individually. When Paul is talking about our bodies being the temple, he's saying as the bride of Christ, everyone is the temple of God in which God dwells. So it's a collective understanding and also an individual understanding. The third point this morning is this. We're talking about the true self. We're talking about identification. And we're talking about living a life reflective of this reality and this truth. The third point is this. Let your eye be single, full of light, and in everything see Christ alone. Jesus talking in Matthew chapter 5 says this. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So this is very interesting, and we've probably heard this before, but one question I would want to present is this. Why does Jesus say I in the singular form? And he doesn't say eyes or eyeballs. And so this is uh, not an insignificant clue, right? Uh, there's something very profound that's going on here, and I'll try to explain. So here is your weekly dose of quantum physics. Or, or biology. So there is this gland in your brain, right? And it is called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland is made of ocular tissue. Ocular tissue, the only other parts of your body that are made of ocular tissue are your eyeballs. But you've got this gland in the middle base, middle bottom portion of your brain. It's called the pineal gland. It is made entirely of ocular tissue. And it's pointing down inside your body. It's, it's, it, if it's, if it's a, a headlight or a frame, it is positioned down at your heart. And it's made of ocular tissue. It's meant to behold something. It's meant to behold something that we can't see with our naked eyes. And do you know what it's meant to behold? The light radiating from within. That light that Jesus says when it's placed on top of a hill, it, it's seen for miles and miles. And it's like that song, right? I'm not going to put it under a bushel, no. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We found it, by golly. We have found it in the mystery of Christ. It is within us, this radiating love and light which emerges from where? Not from out there. It emerges from within here, right? From where Christ 
past dwells, from where your true self dwells, who you really are, when you lay hold of this, it comes to life and light springs forward and somehow this thing in your brain captures that. And what Jesus is saying, if there's a light in your body, then the whole body is full of light, right? This is about salvation. This is about being born again into the life and the love and the glory of Christ Jesus, right? We're not going to put this light under a bushel. No, we are going to let it shine. And as Jesus said, let our eye be single, full of light. And you know what you behold when you see the light in here? When you look out with these natural eyes, you begin to see lights everywhere. In you, in you, in him, in her, in the person in prison, the person in politics, everywhere. Christ, everywhere. Luke 17, 20, 21, and I'm coming to a close. Again, this is Jesus. He was asked by Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, and this is what Jesus said. The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And the translation, the proper translation for in the midst of you, it can mean that it is inside you. The very kingdom of heaven is not only, as Jesus was sharing this, he's saying it's right here, right now. It is within you, the very kingdom of of heaven is right here, right? This is why our eyes should be single so that we can see the kingdom of heaven within and then we see it everywhere without. And our fourth point and final point this morning is this. I am as God made me. I opened up with a passage from 2 Corinthians and then I, I, I went with a, a reference to the Ten Commandments. We're going to return to the Ten Commandments. Not Charlton Heston, not the movie, but the passage in Scripture for just a moment. Exodus chapter 3, two verses, 13 and 14. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is His name? What shall I say to them? This is Moses asking the fire in the bush. Like, who am I going to say sent me? And this was the response. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Right? I am who I am. And so who are you? You are spirit and nothing more than spirit or less than spirit. You are not a physical body that has a soul that also has a, a spirit contained somewhere within. You are the full living expression of the life of God, the life of Christ, right? This should absolutely raise the bar on how we are living our lives, the words that we are speaking. Do we take advantage of other people? Do we strain to keep people out from belonging to the inside? Understanding that we are the reflection and demonstration of Christ in this earth should propel us to live lives of great, great compassion wisdom, understanding, and love, right? It is so important to remember that which you never, ever lost. It's who God created you to be. It is who God created you to be. And this world will lie to you. This world will set up illusions around you and it'll try to relegate you and saying you're nothing more than your age. You're nothing more than your weight. You're nothing more than your name. You're, you're nothing more than your religion. You're nothing more than your relationship status. You're nothing more than the job that you have. You're nothing more than the bank statement which you're in the black anyway or you're in the negative anyway. You're way more than that is what God is showing to us and sharing with us. He is telling us that we are way more than our diagnosis. We're way more than our addiction. We're way more than our selfishness. We're way more than enemies. We're way more than what we've ever thought we were. We are made whole. Here's who you are. 
holiness created you holy. Kindness created you kind. Gentleness created you gentle. Helpfulness made you or created you as being helpful. And perfection created you perfect. You are love because love created you. As our worship team comes to prepare our final song, I've got one more idea, one more suggestion for you this morning. This understanding of who we really are is a game changer. I feel like there should be 10,000 people listening to this message. It's not because I'm arrogant or egotistical, right? Or that I think I'm that good. I'm not. But I feel that the truths contained in the Word of God have not been properly mined out for many of us. And as we go deeper into God's Word, we begin to understand something about His creation, about His beauty, about His goodness, and about His truth. And what we realize, and it's perfectly demonstrated through the life of Jesus Christ is that we are more than what we've ever thought we were. That we are co-heirs and co-laborers with Christ. I want to challenge you, starting today, do this simple practice. Ask yourself, a thousand times a day, who walks with me? Who walks with me? Who walks with me? Who walks with me? Keep saying it over and over. Keep asking this question. Who walks with me? And after enough, it'll be automatic. You'll understand. It's not as though Christ walks with you. Christ walks as you.
Why? 